Welcome viewers. A quick disclaimer before I start the video, I got this idea straight from a channel called Giant Grant Games, where he did no death runs in StarCraft 2, and I just took the idea for myself and applied it to my favorite RTS, which is Battle for Middle Earth 2, and as far as I can tell, no one else has done this sort of thing on YouTube, so I just wanted to give credit where credit is due. For those of you who haven't seen or played the game, Battle for Middle Earth 2 has two campaigns. The Evil Campaign, which is an alternate universe story to The Lord of the Rings, where Sauron wins and you play as the villains, and The Good Campaign, where you play as the elves and the dwarves kind of adjacent to the story to see what they, they were up to during the books. And I'm starting with The Good Campaign because their abilities and units are better suited for this challenge, as you'll um, see and I'll explain kind of through this video. And conversely, in the evil campaign, I'll explain why their units are particularly unsuited, which may sound, sound like the same thing, but it isn't, trust me. So without further ado, here's a little rundown of the challenge. The rules are pretty simple, I just have to rescue any possible allies on the map that I can, and I can't let any of my friendly units die. I don't count any kind of structure as a unit, so if all my towers get destroyed on my base, that's fine as long as the units survive. And as another quick side note, units like Heroes and Builders are just one unit in themselves, but the main army units will have a whole battalion that you select and move as one. And the individual soldiers can die, but I think this mission would be impossible if <laughs> the rules were that strict, so I'm only counting the unit as dead if the whole battalion goes down. And plus, in the gameplay, if you have a banner carrier on your army units, then your soldiers who died will revive. So I'm just headcanoning that the soldiers were injured and then the medic who has the banner will just revive them so it doesn't count as a unit being killed. So as you might have guessed, mission one is just basically a tutorial. So I play it basically the same as you would anyway. Um, you'll see several things happening at once, so you'll see my hero has specific abilities, and at level 1 he can only mount and dismount, and I'm about to go into my powers, where you get power points by killing specific enemies, and then you get power. So I obviously get the heal power, because I'm going to want to be able to heal my units um, in a no death mission. Um, and I'm going to be very careful about using my battalions, especially if they're level 1, because battalions that are level 2 and above will have the banner carrier that I mentioned. Oh, well, these are level 5, but, <laughs> but this is still important. So, um, so if once a unit becomes level 2, whether you get the automatic upgrade or whether you fight enough with them, then they'll get a banner carrier and can revive. Um, but otherwise, if they're level 1, then they're stuck that way. So level 1 units are dangerous, and battalions are dangerous in general, because a lot of them are squishy. Um, not that heroes are invincible, but they can, they can take a lot of hits, and especially if they're mounted like Glorfindel here, you can usually escape from most units. You'll see here that I'm doing my first bout of waiting to make sure that my unit revives. I'm rest assured that you will not see that in this video. I just want to show <laughs> evidence of that because basically every hit and run part of any mission that I do, um, I'm going to spend time to get my units to revive <laughs> because that's how I keep them safe. Um, and yeah, you see how I'm just throwing Glorfindel right into the fray because these goblins just do not have much attack damage. They can't do much to Glorfindel. Um, and so I have him draw their fire while I get a bunch of troops to surround the units and kill them easier. Um, ooh, and Glorfindel's already level 2. Nice. So I find this last group of soldiers to protect from these goblins and... <laughs> Elf, elven soldiers are so much stronger than goblins that I don't have to, I don't even have to help them in this situation. I just do to speed up the process. Um, later on, you'll see how rescuing certain units in the levels can be a lot more challenging than level one, as you might imagine. But now we can finally enter Rivendell. 
So bringing the elves to the gate, um, completed this objective, and brings the magical spotlight. Um, and I won't, I won't narrate every single thing that happens every mission, um, because that would get ridiculous. I guess the point of this is just to show that I, um, I completed the objective, obviously, which moves on to the next objective, and most of the levels in the campaign move linearly like this. So there are certain points where I break sequence or I stick around without completing an objective in order to cheese something to better help the, the mission. And you're going to see that a lot later on. We get a bonus objective to build some more warriors from the barracks. And remember that any unit that we build is now our responsibility to keep alive. So I have to keep track of all of my units here, but I'm just going to let my heroes do most of the work and here we're introduced to our main duo for a lot of these missions which is Glorfindel and Glowin um, who are just absolutely bros. Um, Elrond's joining us for this mission since the goblins are in his house but then he's not going to bother with that um, and this issue that will keep on popping up is movement speed. Um, I'm going to want my units to be in specific places when fighting um, so a lot of times I will let Glowin move ahead um, because Glorfindel and any elven characters move way faster than Glowin and that gets annoying in the sense that, I mean, the obvious reason is that it wastes time and the other reason is that if he's running, if I'm running my army away to try to protect them and heal them later, Glowin's stuck in the back end to just keep on eating hits, and I have to be really careful about that. Um, I spent another five points to get a passive ability that increases my hero's damage, um, which is very good for this campaign. Um, and then I just send the rest of my army down here to brag, I guess, even though I don't need them. And I finally get some archers, even though I don't need them for this mission. I have this massive in-game well, not in-game army, but you know what I mean. I, I have this huge army that I just don't need for this mission. So now the goblins are sending in their second wave, which I'm still not worried about. But my heroes are going to fight their stronger units, which they've brought some monsters along. They brought a mountain giant and a cave troll, I believe. So I'm going to let my heroes handle that. And my army is more than capable of taking out these goblins without dying. I get a bit impatient and just send my heroes out to attack their base down here that I know is here um, before they even send their third invasion out. Um, and I also leave poor Glowin behind instead of waiting for him. But my army is going to take care of that final wave. I'm not worried about them dying. And my heroes are going to start taking out their base. Arwen arrives nice and late to the party with two cavalry units. And as much as I absolutely love cavalry units, and you'll see how great they are um, if you don't know already later on, but I just cannot stress how much I do not need <laughs> any more units in this mission. I've totally got it covered. My core three heroes continue doing Iluvatar's work while I send in Arwen and the cavalry units just to make this quicker. And lo and behold, mission one decides that we also need eagles which um obviously i will use uh, because i will use every resource available to me um but also they will be useful for this last part of the mission the enemy thinks it's being tricky by throwing two more mountain giants at me having a couple arrow tower defenses and such but i will take my army of heroes and cavalry and eagles any day of the week and we take them down easily i have my first close call with some units since i sent my cavalry just straight out into the fray and left two heavily and left two units heavily damaged but thankfully i got them out of harm's way so the run is still currently active I clean up the rest of the goblin buildings with the help of my heroes and eagles and we get to the last part of the mission which is that this worm comes to take us out and they can actually do pretty hefty damage to my heroes but nothing close to killing them in like one or two hits 
so we're just going to keep them on the move and even Glowin is fast enough to outrun the worm as long as you don't stop and my eagles can take it out without taking any damage because flying units are awesome. I move right on to mission 2 in the high pass where we are yet again fighting the goblins and there's this really cool moment in the cinematic with these mountain giants that I think would have hit a lot harder if they weren't in mission 1 but that doesn't really matter to the mission it's just a, an aesthetic thing that I noticed. So mission 2 will be our first build mission and unfortunately the first build missions are always bogged down by having this required build order um, and having to do them as like objectives before you do anything else um, but with the elves thankfully it lets you do multiple of them at once you'll see in the evil campaign later it's a lot more restrictive and annoying just to waste my time I guess while I'm still building, since enemies can't attack from the other side, I just send my heroes straight into the fray, where there are a couple of units and some wild goblins to take care of. I simultaneously build up my base, my pasture, battle tower, and a separate tower on my fortress, while my heroes continue to wreck shop and Glorfindel takes damage. This will be a trend. I send my two heroes up the straightest path to the enemy base, and the mountain giants decide that they don't want me to go there, so they knock down some big ol' ice pillars and force me to reroute. This will not be the only mission in these campaigns that does this trope, um, and it's a bit annoying, but whatever, I guess. Back at my base, I prepare for the rest of the mission by building up some cavalry units, building up some archers for the very end of the mission, and getting my Aresian Forge built, which is the elven upgrade building, um, armory I guess, where you can buy individual unit upgrades like banner carriers to get them to level 2, armor, and weapon upgrades. I start clearing the roundabout path with my two heroes, and they can do almost everything on their own, even when the mountain giants show up with the troops, um, Glowin's hammer can blow them away, um, and here you see that I'm using the specific forest ability that upgrades the armor of the units um, in that trajectory just to increase my hero's survivability here. Um, and despite that, I still have to use a heal because you have to keep a close eye on Glorfindel because he just seems to always take more damage. I buy the necessary upgrades from the Aresian Forge, but I went ahead and sent my cavalry down because in this level the goblins have no pikemen, and your cavalry units can just absolutely run free when there's no pikemen, but you'll see later how it's a big problem when there are, um, but for the most part we're good, and I will just wait to gather resources until I can upgrade my guys. I continue my strategy of using my two heroes as an advance force just so I don't waste too much time, but don't worry because I will become much less bold as the campaign continues. I gather up and fully upgrade the army units that I have, and I assign them into different groups. If you, so a couple little tricks, if you double click on a selected unit, then all of the units of its type on the screen will be selected. So like if I have like seven units of archers, and I double click, then I'll select all of them. And then if you do control and then a number, it will assign a hotkey to specific groups. So I hotkeyed one for my heroes, um, two for the cavalrymen, I believe, and then three and four to separate the swordsmen and the archers, because I have to be very particular about the order in which I send out units, especially later on to keep them safe. My heroes make quick work of these tunnels and units up here and even find a wild cave troll nest and take care of that as well before I start joining up with my army. After walking my heroes up to a certain point where I see this mountain giant, I notice that an event triggers with Haldir and a couple of troops near him 
Now, they will not begin taking damage until I take control of them at around this bin, so I will strategically place my units and then I need to make sure to get them out of harm's way before they're killed. I get enough points to get my first level 10 power, which gets the Lone Axe Tower upgrade, and it is one of the most useful powers um, in this campaign and the evil campaign equivalent also. Um, you'll see how it's able to cheese some things and just overall help out in a lot of situations. I wait until my cavalry units are in place um, nearby the area where Haldir is um, before actually triggering it and then I send my heroes and them ahead and the cavalry will be able to make very quick work of these units um, before they can deal too much damage. Not that I'm worried about Haldir but I am worried about these two units over here. I make sure to upgrade my two new units of swordsmen so they can recover their missing soldiers with banner carriers and Haldir joins my core group of heroes. I let the hero squad take on the buildings as usual while my nearby cavalry runs interference with the goblins that are coming from their base to make sure that that opening is secure and eventually I'll clear out the left side of this map before going for the final base. I use my heroes to quickly destroy these enemy defensive towers at the opening of their base and then send them out into the left, destroy these few remaining buildings, and then I gather my army at the mouth of the enemy base to get ready to attack them. My heroes lead the charge as usual and with my full army I make very quick work of all the enemy units and buildings, but the level has one final trick up its sleeve just like last time where instead of a worm, it sends a watcher in the water. And that's why I have my archers specifically to fire on them with the help of Haldir to take it out. And it seems to be, I mean, maybe I'm crazy, but it seems to be taking much less damage than it did when I played this long time ago. I don't know if that's an, an update 1.9 thing because I'm playing the 1.9 patch when I played the original game as a kid. Um, or if it's just something that I don't remember very well. But anyway, I send my cavalry on the other side of the Watcher where you can't reach just so I can take out the enemy on the other side without having to wait for that. My cavalry serves its purpose up top while I slowly whittle away at the Watcher with my archers and finally defeating it wins me the second level. Mission 3 feels very similar to Mission 2 for me. I mean, maybe it's just that it's snowy again, but it's just a slightly bigger fortress, and they now have Gorkil the Goblin King, who's an enemy hero unit, but, I mean, you know, like, I, I have two heroes, and then when I have a full army, he's not that big of a deal. Um, but there is a little gimmick in the beginning where I rescue more um, people here, Kind of like with Haldir, but um, in more instances. I rescue another group of archers further up the map here um, and congregate with them and then destroy this tunnel and these random goblin archers on the cliff over here. We run into a couple of spiders that are easily dealt with by our heroes before making our way into this bigger battlefield and this ruined elven settlement and together with our new reinforcements that we have to keep track of um, with Haldir that he brings back, we finally have a spot where we can start building. The game lets us know that there are int moots available to rescue, um, which would be our first siege or monster type unit, but I actually don't even end up using it for this mission, um, and I don't have that much of a problem, but given the opportunity I start building up my fortress, and then I build up a couple of arrow towers in the top right um, to protect my building specifically because I know that several raids will come while I try to portion out my um, army to investigate different parts of the map. After building up my defenses and leaving some units up top just to make sure that wandering enemies don't get too far, I start making headway into the south with my heroes until I reach the walls of the enemy base and I start clearing out all of their structures outside of the walls before I get the new objective to kill the Goblin King. 
After one more excursion south to remove a barrel white from its home, I go north, clear out the other buildings that are in wait to free the Entmoot, before I realize that I do not have enough command points to get the Ent. And this is another problem where later on in the levels, command point distribution will become a real problem, especially in this run where I will be unable to sacrifice weaker units in order to clear up command points for stronger units. I destroy one last goblin tower before I'm alerted that there is a drum troll that's trying to summon mountain giants, and while I don't destroy him in time, I do end up destroying the drum, and I'm able to wipe out the mountain giants that were summoned without much issue. One thing that just became relevant this mission is that I could I wasn't able to get the 10 power point power that I wanted, which would increase my resource output. So I ended up getting the Tom Bombadil summon ability, but I cannot use him along with several other powers because if I summon a time limit unit and the time runs out, then that unit would have died and I would have failed the challenge. So the only way that I can summon it is if I can guarantee that they will not be destroyed and that their time will not run out before I can complete the mission. Since I wrapped everything else up in the mission, I send my heroes to take down the walls so that I can let my army in, and after one final assault with some close calls because the enemy had spider rider cavalry units that can damage my non-pikemen units very much, we kill the goblin king, tear down the fortress, and that's the end of mission 3. Mission 4 starts us off with a bang as our troops are on the run from the Dragon Lord um, who is created for this created for this game. He's not a real Tolkien canon character, but his fire breath um, takes out a bunch of my Mirkwood archers who are level 1. So I have to strategically use them to kill the spider layers that are around this area so that I can get them to level 2 before they can start self-healing and self-regenerating their soldiers. As with many other levels, I now have a clear area to set up my resource structure, which are mine shafts, so that I can start getting up resources to build a fortress, and I send out my two heroes to start clearing a path ahead of time while everything else is building. I then cross the bridge with my heroes, defeating the goblins there, which then triggers a cutscene, but that just summons a single troop of spider riders which can poison my heroes but i make sure to keep an eye on their health and use the healing skill as necessary after defeating the spider riders i'm immediately attacked by a bunch of individual spiders who also have the venom sacks upgrade so i use one of glorfindel's new abilities to grant him invincibility and increased attack speed while i build up my fortress and some buildings but instead of letting my army build up and starting to up and starting to upgrade from there, I send my hero straight out into the next cave, not realizing how many spider riders and mountain giants they had waiting for me. This was a major mistake, and I eventually lose Glowin, so this is the first time where I have to reset in a mission. I start attempt 2 much the same, where I use my Mirkwood archers and my Lorien soldiers to take out the spiders, get to level 2 so that they can revive, and then I use my soldiers to clear out the place above and below the bridge, take out the spiders, and then this time, when I get them to the entrance of the cave, I gather my army there um, to provide backup to my heroes, and I start my assault. Um, right off the bat, the spider riders take my soldiers down to, I think, three or two soldiers left, so I focus on getting them out of there and in the fray, Glorfindel gets trapped in the top by himself and goes down, and that's the end of attempt two. In attempt three, I play very responsibly and professionally, so naturally I lose to the spiders because I left my archers right in the front and just let them get eaten to death. In attempt four, I finally wisen up and build some dwarven phalanxes to lead the assault on the Cave of Doom to make sure that my troops don't get overrun by the spider riders, but in typical me fashion, getting into the cave, I don't distribute my troops properly, and my archers are still in the front. It then becomes a very desperate scramble to keep my axe sowers alive, and I almost lose one up top, only to start losing one on the right, and in all of the fray, Glorfindel decides to die again. <laughs> In attempt 5, I start out well in the Cave of Doom by sending my phalanxes out first with my archers in the back for support, 
but as you see, I send both phalanxes to one side, letting some spider riders slip past me, and without me knowing, until I see them attack me from behind, they destroyed my Mirkwood archers, and I'm forced to reset. In attempt 6, I make sure to spread out my phalanxes to take on the spider riders from both sides, and just in case, I let my arch archers hang back until the conflict has already started so that they can provide support without being in any danger. After clearing away the mounted units, I withdraw all of my army units and let my heroes take care of the remaining two mountain giants, letting me finally clear up the cave and its structures, and then letting me build some mine shafts for quick travel between my fortress and the newfound cave. I build some axe throwers to help me take down the dragon later on in the mission, use my army to clear out the little area on the other side of the gate before using my demolishers to destroy the gate itself. I start scouting the map from west to east, starting with my heroes, but with my the rest of my army units close by. I use my phalanxes to help take care of the spiders and my favorite unit, the spider riders. Um, before exploring more to the east in the map, I then separate my heroes and my army, which is just begging for something bad to happen, and my army discovers a cave filled with fire drakes, which have a very strong area of effect attack that destroys the closest phalanx unit and forces me to reset attempt 6. In attempt 7, while clearing the bottom of the bridge, I let Glorfindel get too low of health before the spiders started attacking, and he goes down before we reach the Cave of Death. In attempt 8, I use the same strategy to clear out the Cave of Death without having anyone die, and then I choose to build and upgrade a fortress near the entrance of the cave in order to protect the pathway. I then use my units to again clear out the section on the other side of the gate, then using my demolishers to destroy the gate. Um, I clear out the little hallway to the southwest and choose to leave the rest of my army behind while I use my heroes to go down the hallway to fight the fire drakes. Unfortunately, I realized that I was being attacked from the other side and I had an undefended mine shaft and route that I was trying to protect. And in the meantime, Glorfindel was killed off screen by fire drakes. In attempt 9, I yet again build my fortress in the Cave of Death, but then I also build up several axe towers um, outside all of, all of the mine shafts on the other route to make sure that the enemy won't go back down there, and then I send my main army down into the path, and instead of going to the left to where the fire drakes are, I decide to keep on exploring with my heroes. But unfortunately, I realized that I had left my demolishers to be sitting ducks, and they have a lot of armor and can take a lot of hits, but they are very slow. So I was trying to rescue them, and in the meantime, Glowin got killed this time by spiders. In attempt 10, I used my same tried and true strategy to clear out the Cave of Death, and after building up my axe towers, I make sure that my demolishers are safely tucked away between my buildings so that they don't get attacked again. And while exploring, I actually aggroed a couple of fire drakes to attack my fortress, but thankfully the fortress was hardy enough to stand strong against them, and I was able to send out Glorfindel to finish them off. I then started with the fire drake cave in the northeast, and I sent my heroes out first to take the brunt of the damage while using my axe throwers and Mirkwood archers to kill them. And I used this strategy to take out all three fire drake lairs before gathering my army at the base of the enemy gates. After clearing out some enemy buildings and spider riders, I reach another gate and position my phalanxes in the front to make sure that my archers are protected while the dragon lord and spiders attack me at the same time. I use my archers to attack the Dragon Lord while keeping a close eye on all of my units to make sure none of them die in the process, and upon defeating him, I finally beat Mission 4. Mission 5 starts again with our dynamic duo as they take some troops into the Grey Havens to clear out the Corsairs that are there trying to destroy our buildings. They take down some Malorn trees, but as long as they don't take out my units, I'm completely fine with that. We capture some shipyards that are at the port, and then we have to build four warships in order to take down the pirate ships that are coming our way. I upgrade them fully, which includes a healing upgrade that also grants additional armor 
and a silver thorn arrow weapon upgrade but as the pirate ships keep on coming my ships eventually succumb and i lose the first attempt in attempt two i yet again build four ships and join combat and i try to better micromanage my ships i let one escape when it starts getting damaged i use my healing power to get them up but the enemy ships just keep on coming and i eventually lose a ship again and attempt two in attempt three i use the brilliant strategy of having six ships um but as you might have guessed i lose a ship anyway um, obviously, I could try to get as many ships as possible, but the problem with that issue is each ship costs me command points and I don't have infinite command points, and then I would be unable to get any other type of unit later on for the later parts of the mission. I lose attempt 4 and 5 in the same way, and so in attempt 6, I started to shake it up with what I call the int strategy. I start by purchasing Treebeard from an int moot, and then as many ints as I can build with a command point before I build my ships. I then build my four ships, and I keep them close to my docks while I have the ints on the side, hoping that the ints can provide enough cover fire to protect my ships. Um, as the battle goes along, I realize that they're not doing a whole bunch of work, but I try it out anyway, but I end up losing a ship. I used int strategy for one more attempt in attempt 7 before I realized that I really didn't think the ints were cutting it or they were not worth the command points put together. So for attempt 8, I build 7 ships, I divide 4 on one side and 3 on the other side, and go for a guerrilla strategy. I figured out that by hustling my... <laughs> I said hustling, I meant huddling. By huddling my ships in the corners, there was a point where the enemy ships would not notice my ships and they would just stop in their tracks. So then I would go and use each side to harass them, draw a couple ships out and destroy them, and then head back into my corner before my ships died, let them heal back up to full, and then complete the process again. It was slow going, especially because one thing I forgot to mention is this mission was built with a ship called the um, the Elven Whirlpool, the Storm Ship, that's it, the Elven Storm Ship in mind, and the Storm Ship is a ship that one of them can create a giant whirlpool and take a bunch of enemy units out at once, which is great for a bunch of congregated enemy ships, but it's a suicide ship, so I can't use it in a no units lost mission. So I have to take out the much superior enemy force with my ships, which is why I use the guerrilla tactics. I finally get past the first part, which lets me get to the enemy beach, capture their docks so that they're no longer building Corsair ships. Um, I do this with my heroes in a transport ship, and then this begins the enemy land invasions. I noticed with these recordings that I began having issues, so it cut off till the end of this attempt, but what happened is I had my warships down below, I was dealing with the landed assault with my land forces, and one of my ships um, got sank in the meantime because the enemy had some Corsair ships es escorting their transports. And so I had to figure out a way to deal with both ends of the battle at the same time because it's really hard f to manage for multiple fronts when you're trying not to have any units die. So for attempt 9, since I had my guerrilla strategy down packed for my ships and I knew I wouldn't have to worry about that, before I captured my shipyards, I use all the command points available to build up an army, and then I build up multiple fortresses on the beach to ward off the enemy invasion, and I've set some archers on the middle hill to take care of the, of the rest, and the hope is that with these and several battle towers on the beach, that I won't really have to worry about the land invasion and I can focus on targeting the enemy ships with my ships so that they don't die and the fortresses can do much of the work. The second thing that this does is as you might have realized at this point, I already have an eagle and I'm going to get more eagles from each fortress. And this is an interesting quirk that I noticed. I'm pretty sure when I played as a kid that eagles didn't cost command points. 
and you just bought them and they didn't change your command point limit at all but eagles seem to be costing 60 now and this this is patch 1.9 as i think i mentioned once before um that i guess they changed for that but it let me go above the command point limit so i just made sure to get the Merkwood archers that I wanted before building these eagles above the command point limit and it's just a weird quirk that I noticed also the I love the different eagle designs on the sprites because in the first version of the game that I played all the eagles were the same sprite and they were brown and now there's like a whole variety of them and you'll see them more as we go along um, but yeah so after taking their base we get through the first invasion and it goes pretty well some of my arrow towers fall but they're not that important i noticed that my archers won't fire from the center hill i feel like they should be able to but they kept on going near the ground so i just made sure that they didn't die and then we get some dwarven allies for the second invasion now they're not super important i don't really add them to my force but i do build another dwarven fortress just to bolster our defenses and then do the same strategy for the second invasion. But in the second invasion, all of the escorts, including enemy bombardment ships, do take down some of my ships. Yet again, the footage cut off for that, but I decided to be more careful with my ships in later attempts. For attempt 10, I tried to ambush the second invasion at the bottom of the screen, but I quickly got overwhelmed and I lost a ship that way. In attempt 11, I stormed the beach um, during the first invasion to take out their ships, not realizing that the goblin archers on the shore were firing on my ships and I lost a ship that way. And in attempt 12, I didn't even make it to the first invasion because I was, well, use, I was moving my transport around and I let the enemy build up a bunch of ships at their docks more than I realized and they took down a ship there. For attempt 3, I went through all of the usual motions. In the first invasion, I sent my attack ships out, making sure to keep them healthy with my heal spell, um, while the ground forces were taken out mostly by the fortress, but also with the help of my eagles and archers. In the second wave, I carefully laid my ships on one side and kept them clumped together so that they would only attack a few ships at a time so that they could take out some of the enemy ships while I used basically the same thing on the ground forces with the help of the dwarven fortress now. And then in the third invasion, I just had my ships completely clear away because the enemy ships were too well guarded. This caused me to receive bombardments on my fortresses and towers from their ships, and also some of their ships would fire on my eagles if they got too close, but overall it wasn't too difficult, and I was able to destroy the rest of their land units, which won me the mission. So mission 6 is very interesting for multiple reasons. So first of all, we don't have our dynamic duo anymore. We're led by King Dane of the Iron Hills and his dwarves. And this is also a no-build mission, so we will be crossing the Selduin River, and we collect troops as we go along, and we don't really have a big segment where we build a fortress or anything. We don't get builders like that. Um, so unfortunately, as we go along and rescue people, it is A, going to be difficult to rescue them, and B, they will be pre-damaged in level one. So like, even though I want to use these Men of Dale that I just got, um, they're already way too weakened and they don't have banner carriers to heal up. So I have to leave the two damage troops behind and continue as best I can forward, um, which doesn't last very long in this attempt as I rescue two troops from this first part. But then the second part, there's a Nazgul and a Fell Beast and a bunch of people and they kill um, some dwarf guardians and as you might have noticed from some of the earlier missions but I didn't outright say the enemy will very strongly target the weakest or a single troop so it's very difficult to get them away and if they're under attack units will want to attack back even if you move them so for a variety of reasons this mission is very interesting and requires a lot of skill I start out a little bit differently in attempt two. I let Dane lead by himself to try to get some experience on him and go forward to the first group of allies. And I have them run back as soon as I can. And with the enemies that chase them, I pincer them 
with Dane in the new units as well as the old units that I had further back before moving on to the next group of units. And I don't know if it was the placement or because I stayed back so long, but the Nazgul actually flew out before I reached the second group of units. So I actually didn't have to do with it, which was great. And then after dancing around the attack troll specifically and the other enemy units that they have, I'm able to rescue them and then I wait a little bit just for them to be restored with their banner carriers. I quickly dispatch of two troops of orcs. And then going further down, I find two more Men of Dale that I rescue from an attack troll and several other troops, and I get them without a problem. I separated my level 1 Men of Dale with King Dane to try to get them to level up and get banner carriers, but I run into a much bigger group of enemies than I was expecting. And even though I tried to send in King Dane, use my powers to summon an axe tower to maybe draw some fire, I couldn't get the phalanx to escape in time and one of the units goes down. In attempt 3, I learn from my mistakes and send my whole army down to help rescue the two phalanxes, and I take a very aggressive approach to destroy the enemies before they get to me. I send Dane out on his own um, off to the left side of the screen to destroy their catapult, but then he gets surrounded by troops while I'm focusing on trying to save my army units, and King Dane ends up going down. In attempt 4, I kept my army together including with Dane and tried to cut my way through to the phalanxes on the right side, basically hoping that the catapult fire just wouldn't take me out. I strategically used my healing to make sure that the troops survive, and I eventually cut through the enemies, and I have to chase down some of their long range units like their firebomb corsairs, eventually getting to another group of friendly soldiers who I get together with and am able to defeat the enemy units with an axe tower and the new troops and start to get a sizable army. I reach a base of sorts and am able to rescue the last bit of my army and since my command points are over the limit I can't make any new units and I don't have any builders to build fortresses but I at least have a hearth to heal my units at the center of there, some buildings to distract enemies and because I have the Hall of Warriors, I can have banner carrier upgrades for all my troops that aren't level 1 yet. I can't use any of the neutral buildings, but I capture them anyway for a moral victory, and then the enemy starts a Moomakill invasion. The Moomakill are pretty tough and dangerous as you might imagine, but they like to target buildings, so I use my hearth, and then I used a summoned axe tower later on. And then with the help of King Dane and my archers, I'm able to take down all three Moomakill and repel the assault. Now it's time for me to go on the offensive. I send out King Dane alone to go across the shallows, and he fights down some catapults, and plays tag with a bunch of their units and catapults until he gets near the other shore. I didn't realize a summoned worm was showing up to party, so King Dane flees for his life back to the shore while I send my army to meet him up in the middle. Eventually I'm able to repel all of the enemy units, and the worm runs out of its time limit, and I'm able to bring my entire army into the beach where the enemy fortress is. I defeat several of their buildings and troops, even defeating a Nazgul on a fell beast, but I eventually lose a phalanx. On attempt 5, King Dane died on his retreat back to the base from the river crossing. On attempt 6, I did the river crossing with my entire army and King Dane, sending King Dane to destroy Catapult and the rest of the army to fight off some of the other troops, and I unknowingly triggered a second worm in the south side, so I escaped that, ra so I escaped that worm, went back up north, triggered that worm, went back to my base, um, healed up and then I assaulted the base from the north until I defeated the Nazgul and trolls and such there, and then after regrouping, I went and attacked the south base and drove towards the fortress until I won. But I didn't catch the footage of the final run towards the fortress, and that wasn't good enough for me. So then I did attempt 7, where I finally won and got, it, and got the footage of it. And now I finally come to the mission that I've been dreading since the beginning of this challenge, Erebor. 
So Erebor is like mission 5 of the Grey Havens dialed up to 15. I have 15 minutes to build up some defenses against a huge wave of enemies and then after that first wave there are two subsequent waves where I only have four minutes in between each to prepare. And that's also misleading because before the first wave and also in between each wave there are separate many waves of enemies that are constantly sent at me so I have to make sure that I'm aware of them whenever they come. Unfortunately, I start with four axe throwers and two guardians in my command points. Um, I don't, I can't really use guardians, and I would much prefer men of Dale to axe throwers if I could help it. But I have to take what I'm given. I'll reveal at the end why I'm doing this, but I'm changing up the editing style for this mission, where I'm going to go through and just describe the major changes rather than each attempt and where I failed. Um, to have a more coherent narrative. Naturally, I started by building some mine shafts for some extra resources and taking stock of all the buildings and units that I already had, and then I started building my fortresses. So there are three main entrances into the main fortress. Two of them are ungated, and so I put a fortress in front of each of those, and then I also put a fortress in front of the main gate. I'm then going to build a fourth fortress down in the front of the Dale area where the main waves are going to be coming from. So this will be my main attacking point and will be a base of operations for all the units that I use to surround it. I eventually build mine shafts before the first wave nearby each of the individual fortresses so that I can ferry units more easily between each location. I send King Dane out in front of the first fortress because I know that some Corsairs are going to come by before the first wave starts and he can help take care of them with the help of the fortress. I buy upgrades in my pre-built buildings to get fire arrows, armor, and banner carriers because my unit of choice at first are going to be Men of Dale. So I'm going to build five troops of Men of Dale and then use my axe throwers as well to provide archery support and my only close quarters unit other than the fortresses themselves are going to be King Dane. With my fortress upgraded and set, I start sending my troops out to the front to meet the massive wave that's about to start. I also summon lone towers around the, um, around the opening of the field to try to help a little bit and distract some of the fire and I eventually get down to the nitty gritty. The first wave has a lot of Corsairs and Haradrim archers, but they aren't that much of a problem as long as I keep my troops behind the fortress. The problem comes when a bunch of cave trolls and battering rams start showing up, and I'm unable to destroy them before they destroy my mineshaft and fortress. I play around with different army compositions around the Men of Dale. Um, at first I used the Men of Dale and Axe Throwers alongside of each other, but then I stopped using the Axe Throwers when they became too much of a liability because of their slow movement speed. So then I had some catapults provide cover fire for Men of Dale, but I lost a couple of attempts from my own catapult fire, and they didn't seem to be helping enough to warrant that. But then, as with the axe throwers, I started phasing out the men of Dale in exchange for battle wagons. Battle wagons are the closest thing dwarves have to cavalry units. They're on they only come one at a time, but they have a higher movement speed and trample. I build eight of them eventually, with two of them being hearth upgraded um, battle wagons and the rest being phalanx upgraded. So the phalanx ones are my main attacking ones and the hearth ones can keep the others healthy when I split them into squads. After several attempts, I finally reached the obvious conclusion that I need more fortresses where the enemies are coming out. I don't build the fortress in front of the main gate because I don't find it as necessary, and instead start building two and eventually three fortresses before wave one starts in order to help repel the attack better. After wave 1, we immediately begin what I call mini wave 1, which is a series of mountain trolls that are sent up the east side into the unprotected entrance, which is why it was so important to build a fortress and fully upgrade it in the mouth of that entranceway. 
At first, I was driven to send units through the mineshaft in order to help take out these trolls quicker, but then I realized that it wasn't much of a problem to just leave them to my fortress, and that reduced the risk of my units dying to the trolls or from my own fortress's catapult fire. In wave 2, my first instinct was to try to keep my fortresses alive as long as possible, even using my units to divert fire, but I start consistently getting past wave 2 by instead of trying to keep my fortresses alive, focusing on my units, and this includes keeping all of my battle wagons in one group instead of separating them to make sure that I don't lose track of them, using King Dane to fight off the summoned worm to keep them off of my battle wagons, and then later on hunting down any Mumakil that are left in the wave after they've destroyed the fortresses. Mini Wave 2 isn't very difficult to deal with, but is a little bit more interactive because it's a bunch of Corsairs that descend from the west, and while I do have a fortress in the west to defend the entrance, the Corsairs keep on moving and slip past them. So I have to send my battle wagons, usually while the, rem the remnants of Wave 2 are still marching on Dale, um, in order to run them down before I can hunt down the remaining Moomakill. And now we come to wave 3, which as you might imagine is the hardest of the bunch by far. Wave 3 has a single Nazgul on a fell beast that usually isn't difficult to deal with, though one time it wasn't taken care of by my fortress somehow and started chasing my battle wagons, which is when I figured out that the fell beast can fly inside of the fortress. I was pretty sure that I would be safe if I got inside, but then it continued following me and that was pretty funny. As for the rest of Wave 3, it is just a bunch of trolls. Attack trolls, drummer trolls, mountain trolls. They survive bombardments. Um, I can use Daybreak to temporarily freeze them, and I try to use this as a way to use my armies. At first just Battle Wagons, sometimes just King Dane, and then I tried one Hail Mary with just all of my army units to take out as many attack trolls as possible but it ended up being too dangerous and not worth it. I just let the petrified trolls be peppered by attacks from my remaining fortresses, and then eventually they will just start taking out every building in their path. I kept stubbornly trying to thin out the trolls' numbers in the beginning of the wave, but one major thing that prevented me from doing this is the Fires of Mount Doom ability. So during wave 1, the enemy will use a massive rain of fire that will almost always destroy a unit even if they're on the move. So I had to avoid that altogether by keeping my units completely separate from the wave until they use the power on my mine shaft instead of any units. The trolls will attack any building in their vicinity, and there are a bunch of buildings in Dale that they will attack first, but it doesn't help for very long. And by the time a massive group of trolls starts coming towards my fortress, it's usually game over. The good news is that there's no wave 4, but the bad news is, is that there is a mini wave 3. A bunch of Nazgul led by the Mouth of Sauron with some attack troll and orc escorts come in from the northeast of my fortress, basically already on my buildings, and start tearing up anything in their way. By themselves, they aren't that much of a problem, but they reduce the amount of buffer between me and the attack trolls that I don't want to deal with and that I need to damage as much as possible while I stall them. The good news is that I also get reinforcements. I get some elves led by King Thranduil, alongside our buddies Glorfindel and Glowin, who are finally back to party. Being the only mounted hero, I try to use Glorfindel to distract some attack trolls in several attempts, but then I decide it's too risky because inevitably my attention will be driven elsewhere, and once Glorfindel gets surrounded by multiple attack trolls, it usually means that he's going to die. The solution to this was to just keep all of the elf reinforcements, including Glowin, all together and send them directly into the mineshafts as soon as they show up. This lets me bring the troops out of the mineshafts and deal with the Nazgul retinue as quickly as I can before I can bring them into the center to deal with the attack trolls. As if all of this wasn't enough, another small group of trolls on top of the massive amount of trolls that are left over after destroying my main fortresses start going straight towards the main gate. But wait, there's more! The enemy also tries to build their own fortresses and buildings in the south, 
in order to provide more reinforcements, but I just do not let that happen. I send all of my battle wagons to the bottom of the screen, and I just send them to destroy the builders and buildings as soon as they're being made. With my dwarves from the beginning, my battle wagons, and my elf reinforcements, I do have a sizable army now. But unfortunately, it's very hard to keep singular units alive when there's just so many trolls coming. So I locked all my armies inside the center room, just shivering and waiting for the enemies to come kill me. Until I remembered an old adage that my grandpappy used to say, When in doubt, build more fortresses! The answer seemed very obvious, but as the trolls were coming, I started building fortresses in the center, which eventually led me to a super attempt where my elves killed the Nazgul super fast. I routed everything into the center room, built two fortresses, one between the main fortress and the gate, and one in, right in front of the main fortress, and this was finally able to kill the rest of the trolls with a little bit of help from my four heroes and the Mirkwood archers I was given. Just in case anyone was wondering, this took me 41 attempts before I was finally able to beat Erebor Deathless. I figured this would be the most challenging mission from the get-go, and I was not disappointed. But if you stick around, mission 8, the final mission, is going to be a fun one. Now if you're watching this video because you like seeing a hard challenge overcome, then hopefully you've enjoyed it so far, but the last mission may be anticlimactic for you but I hope it's still entertaining. So funnily enough, even though it's the last mission, I did complete it in one attempt. So you will be seeing practically the entire attempt cut down into smaller segments. And also I beat this level the same exact way in this challenge that I used to as a kid. And part of the reason is that I played this game like someone would play SimCity and you're about to see what I'm talking about. So the mission starts with Elrond and an army that has already taken up 600 command points, which is definitely a decent amount and heavily restricts what I'm able to make. But I don't hate this too much because even though we have archers that aren't as good as Mirkwood archers, they're still decent, especially when I get my Silverthorn arrows. But more importantly, I have two cavalry units, which I will heavily use for scouting and clearing the way forward. Despite being the last mission, the beginning of this is very generous. I'm given plenty of resources, definitely enough to build a fortress, and any buildings for units that I may want. With Elrond and all of my units, I have more than enough to beat back any waves that the enemy sends, but I have some close calls in the beginning. The enemy sends waves from the east, west, and from the center down from its main gate. And these are usually just a couple of units, like two orc units or two orc archer units, along with a troll, like a drummer troll from the center or an attack troll from the east. And these aren't very hard to deal with once my troops are in position, but they took me unawares at first and almost destroyed a builder. And then when I sent in my swordsmen, they also got dangerously low. But thankfully I was able to defeat all of the enemy units before I lost any of my units. My first priority, other than the obvious of trying to keep my units alive, is to get my upgrades purchased so that I can upgrade all of my units and then they become less likely to die. Then I can focus on the first main objective of the mission, which is to capture two signal fires, one in the southeast and one in the northwest. The path to each signal fire is inundated with spiders' nests. So the first thing I do is to send out my cavalry units to not only scout ahead, but to take out each spider nest one at a time until I reach the small enemy bases that surround each signal fire. After clearing all the spiders, I gather the necessary troops I need in order to take out each base one at a time, but I make sure not to capture the signal fires yet. I build fortresses at each end near the signal fires, make sure all of the enemies have been removed, and then I sent units to either side and made sure to capture both of them at approximately the same time. Before I capture the signal fires, I make sure that I build up the army in the composition that I want and use up as much command points as I can because once I light each signal fire, I will get reinforcements from both Mirkwood and Erebor. Once I get the reinforcements from Erebor, I finally have access to Dwarven builders. 
This is great because not only can I now get dwarven upgrades for the axe throwers that I've been holding on to and all the units that I now receive, but I have access to dwarven fortresses and dwarven walls. I will eventually use the dwarven walls to build around my main base in the center and this will repel basically any enemy waves that they can send at me. With all of this now set up, I have walls that are completely upgraded to repel enemies, and inside I have 7 heroes including Treebeard, and over 2500 command points worth of an army that I have now fully upgraded. And I'm not going to use any of them. <laughs> so as, as some of you might have noticed, um, I've been building eagles. Um, so I built 7 elven fortresses in all. Um, fully upgraded them and got eagles from all of them. So I now have my eagle squad, aka my zero squad, because that's what I control them with, with control zero. So with seven eagles, I now fly around the entire map, destroy every arrow tower that can possibly damage them, eventually go through the buildings, and no units can touch me. Even when I'm not being extremely careful, it takes a lot to take down my eagles, and I can easily send a couple of them to the corner of the map and still have a bunch of firepower left, and eventually Dol Guldor falls, just like that. There's a small wave that they try to send on the map, but not only is it pathetic compared to what came during Erebor, but I can just take it out with my level 20 powers that I've been able to get because of the constant little waves that came in this mission. So yeah, like I, like I said, not much of a challenge, but I don't know, I thought it was very fun. It was, it was something almost therapeutic about sending a flying force just over this evil dungeon fortress. But yeah, so that's the good that's the good guys. Um, after all these years, um, all these decades, the Eagles finally defeated Mordor, just like the fans wanted.